Take a look for yourself. That's nothing from this world. Welcome to UFOU. I'm your host, Doug Moffat. The following footage, courtesy of Studio 10, covers an amazing close encounter of the second kind, seen by over 200 witnesses that defies explanation over 50 years later. Do you believe in UFOs or unidentified flying objects? Well, many Australians do, and none more strongly than people who were confronted by something very strange in suburban Melbourne 50 years ago. We can work it out. It's April 1966 and more than 200 students and a dozen teachers at two Melbourne schools are sure they've just had a close encounter. This is Australia's most famous UFO sighting. The object stayed on the ground for more than 20 minutes, then took off rapidly and some say it was buzzed by five aircraft. The school children were warned never to speak of it. Authorities telling them that flying saucers just don't exist. But 50 years later, witnesses insist they know exactly what they saw. It's incredible. Wow. It was called the Westall Incident. And joining us now, three of the people who were there when they were school children all those years ago. In Melbourne, Joy Clark and Terry Peck. And in Brisbane, Jackie Argent. And also with us in Canberra, principal researcher for this UFO incident, Shane Ryan. Good morning to all of you and thanks for joining us. Good morning. Let's begin with Joy and Terry in Melbourne. Can you tell us what you saw? Yes, Natasha. Um, I was out playing cricket on the Oval at the time and we noticed these three craft hovering above the school, um, which was a bit unusual. They were definitely weren't aircraft. And then after about 10 minutes, we saw one go down into an area behind our school called the Grange, where we used to do our cross-country runs. So being a little bit of a rebel, as I was at school, um, I was one of the first to run through and jump over the fence and arrive at the Grange, and it was on the ground in front of me. The, the other two girls had arrived before me, and one was hysterical, Tanya, and the other girl had fainted. So I just looked at it, and after a few minutes, it just raised up above me, probably to about well, 12 feet, turned on its side, and went zoom straight up into the air and disappeared almost instantly. And there were two other craft in the air at the time. Joy, did you see something similar? And what were you thinking it was at that stage? Were you convinced it was a UFO? Look, uh, I didn't know what it was. I'd, yes, definitely a UFO. Um, I was actually in science class and we had a um, stu student had rung in and flung the door open and said, Mr Greenwood, Mr Greenwood, there's things in the sky, there's flying saucers in the sky. So we all ran down the corridor and out onto the oval and yes, there were flying saucers in the sky. I saw three of them, um, but it took me quite a while to sort of comprehend what I was looking at because I'd never seen anything like that before. Jackie, it's quite um, intriguing. Did you also see those flying saucers? I saw a flying saucer. I don't recall there being more than one. Um, but we were down the back, I was down the back of the oval with Tanya when we noticed it in the sky. Um, it did some manoeuvres which were very strange, which is why our attention was drawn to it in the first place. And then it came down over the Grange. We could see it coming down, so we took off after it. Um, Tanya actually reached the craft, I believe. I didn't, um, because she came back screaming towards me and then I ran back with her to the school. She got taken away in an ambulance and that was the last time I saw her. And, and can you tell us a bit more about these craft? What colour were they? How big were they? Did they actually land or were they just hovering above the ground? The craft I saw was silver in colour. It was round. It did come down on the ground, even though I didn't see it on the ground, I saw the marks that it left um, later on that day. It could move incredibly fast and it could also appear to stand still. When it took off from the other aircraft that were buzzing it, um, it made them look as though they were at standstill. 
Right. And, and Shane, skeptics have dismissed the event as just the product of the fertile imagination of children. Uh, what's your response to that? Some skeptics have, and there are other skeptics, I think, who take a more serious look at a story like this, a story which has so much witness testimony. Uh, I'd like to begin by paying tribute to Joy and Terry and Jackie and all the other witnesses who have been brave enough to come forward and talk about this story. Ninety-six witnesses so far have been happy to talk to me about the flying saucer that they saw. 147 people have come forward and spoken to me about the circles in the paddocks that were left behind by the flying saucer. So if you just look at those numbers alone, you realise we're looking at something pretty important. Now, remember, when we talk about UFOs, obviously in the general social conscious consciousness, people think about extraterrestrial craft. UFOs simply means unidentified flying objects. We don't know what an extra, extraterrestrial spaceship, for example, would look like. Now, it just simply means something that was seen in the sky that nobody could easily identify. And I think we have to begin with that. Now, as interesting as a program as The X-Files is, and absolutely it is, I think this is a UFO story that all Australians need to uh, know about, need to take seriously. Can I ask what happened to the girl? You, um, you took her back to the school, the one that was hysterical. Is it Tanya? Mm -hmm. And um, she went into the hospital and then you went to visit her at her place and they said she didn't live there. That's yes, right. I, went to, I went to her house the following day and an English-speaking woman opened the door and said there had never been a Tanya living there. Now, the problem with that is that Tanya's parents didn't speak English to start with. I think they were Yugoslavian. So oh. I've been to this house a lot of times and then was told, no, sorry, you're mistaken. Oh, my God. That's so gimmick. what's happened to her? Do you know if she disappeared? Have you had any contact with her? Do you know where she is and what, what happened? I have had no personal contact with her. I know one of the researchers has. She prefers to stay anonymous and not be involved in anything at all. She told the researcher that she had no recall of what had happened. And then there was a very odd story about her parents putting her in a convent for some reason that was to me, totally ridiculous. That's it. <laughs> Terry, we've seen drawings that look like a flying saucer and even two flying saucers. Can you describe for us what was there? Yes, um, it was about one and a half times the size of a normal um, family sedan and it was round, silver coloured. There were all lights around the bottom of it, no windows. Um, it threw off a bit of a heat and it was making a low buzzing sound. Did any of you at all witness anyone inside these unidentified flying objects? Did you see anyone? No. 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 All right, Joy, Terry, Jackie and Shane, stay with us because we're going to chat with you more uh, right after this short break. Now, We've heard firsthand from these accounts, but Australian authorities are actually accused of covering up what really happened. So what's the truth? Don't go anywhere. We'll return in just a moment. Welcome back. Now, returning to our special examination this morning of the West Hall incident. Now, it happened 50 years ago when many people reported seeing a UFO land in suburban Melbourne. We're joined once again by Joy Clark and Terry Peck in Melbourne and in Brisbane, Jackie Argent. Now, they were just school children at the time and clearly remember what they saw. Also joining us from Canberra is principal researcher for this specific UFO incident, Shane Ryan. Joy, to you firstly, now, you were interviewed by journalists, reporters at the time. What has happened to your story since then and do you think there has been a cover-up? Oh, absolutely. Um, that film, I was interviewed by Channel 9 and at the front of the school and a man walked up to me. He was in blue, so he may have been Air Force or perhaps police, I'm not sure. Put his um, hand on my shoulder and told me to stop talking and go back into the school and then turned around to the film, uh, the cameraman and the reporter and told them both to go away. But previous to that happening, um, not long after the sighting, um, the army arrived opposite the school in three um, 
jeeps and jumped out of the back and they were in uh, camouflage gear and all that sort of stuff. So they were sort of out the school for quite a while. And then we had a, a special assembly. We were all called to a special assembly and told that we hadn't seen anything. It was a weather balloon. We we're all massively hysterical. Don't talk about it. If you talk about it, you'll get into trouble. And I got detention because I had been interviewed by oh. Channel 9. Joy, let me ask you a little bit more about that. What, what would you say, because there might be people listening to your story uh, today and being a little sceptical and thinking you're, you're a little girl, sometimes memories can change, even though we're convinced that we see a particular thing. And perhaps it was a weather balloon or some um, other sort of aircraft and not necessarily a UFO. No. Definitely UFO. I'd never seen anything like it before and we were used to seeing aircraft because we weren't that far away from Moorabbin Airport. So we would quite often see the little planes fly around. So we it was nothing like I've ever seen ever since either. Just how old were you? Twelve and a half. Okay. And how soon after you saw the flying saucers did the uh, Army and or possibly Air Force personnel show up? How quickly did they get there? Um, I reckon probably 25, 30 minutes. Right. And, and Shane, do you think um, that this could have been uh, some kind of piece of military equipment or uh, some other type of um, you know, apparatus that's perfectly innocent? Well, I take a, an agnostic view of, of UFOs and this particular UFO story included because we simply don't know. We don't know what UFOs are. But I think it's fairly obvious that it's difficult to find simply a, a prosaic, mundane explanation for what so many of these witnesses saw. It's easier for us to say what it wasn't. If you look at the evidence, if you sit down with the hundreds of witness testimonies, we can say fairly confidently this obviously wasn't an aeroplane, it wasn't a helicopter, it wasn't a drone, it wasn't a kite, and I don't mean to prick anyone's balloon, but it wasn't to me, quite obviously, a meteorological balloon or anything like that. So then we're left with the mystery, what was it? Now remember, when we talk about UFO stories, it's often these days lights in the skies, people out in the outback seeing something while they're alone. This happened in broad daylight, literally hundreds of witnesses. And not only did the flying saucer fly low over two schools, in front of all these students and local workers and residents and some teachers, it landed. It was either on the ground or close to the ground for several minutes. And in addition to that, there was this incredible response to this incident. As so Joy has shame. mentioned, police, military and more. You, I understand you're a little sceptical at the start before you investigated this. Sure. And, and you seem also to be saying you're impressing that it's an unidentified flying object. And then you're calling it a flying saucer. Is it, do you think it's an alien craft? Do you think aliens were in there? Or are you sort of playing it safe here? Well, I'm trying to be rational. I'm trying to be logical. I'm trying to be fair to the evidence. I often like to refer to it as a flying source because that's what it was called at the time. Mm -hmm. It was called that because that's what it looked like. A saucer turned upside down on another saucer or bowl. That was the shape that it presented. It was an unidentified flying object. It was seemingly a solid metallic looking object that flew that nobody could identify. Now I think that's as much as we can say but what is really interesting is the level of response to whatever this was, and I don't know what it was, but certainly the government authorities, the Royal Australian Air Force, the Army, the Civil Defence Organisation, all responded on this day. Why did they respond and why? In addition to that, is there no information about this incident publicly available in any of the government archives? They're some of the interesting questions. Terry, over the years you've heard what authorities have said about this incident. How do you feel about what they say about it? Well, look, it's, it's hard to know. Jessica's right in a way. Over the many years our memories do change a little bit, but it is burned into my memory. Um, I know what I saw and no matter what anyone says, I know that it was something very unusual and the way it took off at that speed, I'd out very much if there was anything in that day that could take off like that. Mm. 
Shane, you claim you've spoken to more than 100 witnesses. Why do you think there was a cover-up, it seems, at very, very high levels? Well, that's the $94 million question, I guess. We do know that a very high-ranking public servant from the Department of Supply was dispatched to Westall that day. He investigated. And after that wonderful Australian documentary, Westall 66, a suburban UFO mystery, was aired on Australian television in 2010, his daughter contacted me and said, thank you, thank you for having that documentary made because my father was there that day mm. and he suffered for what he saw and she and her brother, I've spoken to them both, really believe that his untimely death just four years later was connected with the stress that was applied to him because he tried to get answers to what happened. Why the cover-up? What could it possibly have been 50 years ago that would now be a threat to national security or anybody's reputation or any alliance with another country? Is that possible after 50 years? I think we need the answers. So Jackie, do you think you'll ever find out about the, the mystery? No, I doubt it very much. Um, initially I would have said it was some sort of test aircraft. I fell in line with that theory. But there's never been an aircraft to my knowledge today that can do what that did. So, mm -hmm. so sorry, I, I, I had a question for you, but I just think, um, are you glad to have been able to speak out about this after so long? Do you feel relief? Um, no, not really. Mm. <laughs> I think the I think the experience actually contributed to my my demeanour as an adult. Um, the way that I handle situations and the way that I respond in a critical situation in particular. So the bullying that I underwent with those men that came to the school, which was definitely bullying now, has made me more resolved in the way I've lived my life. Is that the same for all of you? Yes and no. Um, I think I've gone a little bit the opposite where I've become more outspoken and I don't take um, people's criticism and trying to tell me that I was crazy because I know what I saw. So I won't, nothing will change my resolve, it's in my brain forever. Thank, well, thank you. you so much for sharing your thoughts and your stories with us this morning. We really appreciate it. Joy Clark and Terry Peck in Melbourne, Jackie Argent in Brisbane and Shane Ryan in Canberra. We genuinely really, really appreciate your time. What an extraordinary event. Credible witnesses supported by a pragmatic, logical, principal researcher such as Shane Ryan. It all adds up to an event that needs to be seen by everyone. And what happened to Tanya? Feel free to leave your comments and stories via the email in the description below. If you like the show, please hit the like button. And if you want to see further episodes, subscribe and become a Doug Addict.